Hey everybody, this is Warren Sharp, NFL analyst over at Sharp Football Analysis. I want to welcome you to the Ringer Gambling Show. Join me on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays each week during the NFL season with guests Chris Vernon, Ben Solak, and Joe House to guide you through the NFL betting landscape. We'll be talking spreads, game totals, parlays, player props, futures, and much, much more. Be sure to follow the Ringer Gambling Show on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From the snacks you choose to the settings on your TV, you personalize every aspect of your viewing experience because it's better that way. That's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer availability and eligibility may vary. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. The Rewatchables is brought to you by The Ringer and The Ringer Podcast Network, where I just put up a special two-part podcast with Cousin Sal about the NFL season. We played guest the lines for week one. We did AFC, NFC over-unders. We did a whole bunch more. I also screwed up at the top of the podcast. I was promoting our Ringerverse podcast, which is excellent, by the way. And they had an instant reaction episode for Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. And I didn't know the name of the movie. I'm admittedly not a Marvel guy. I'm not a nerd culture guy. I never know what's going on in that universe, as we've discussed many times on this pod. But in this case, I was dead wrong. I should have been celebrating a great weekend for the Asian American community. I definitely should have known the name of the movie off the top of my head. Um, So we cut that part out of the podcast and that's that. If I'm ever wrong on a podcast or anywhere else, we're always going to try to fix it as fast as we can. So that's what we did there. Really sorry about that. Uh, Anyway, we're going to move on to this podcast. Coming up, Miami Vice, the TV show, Cal Derone's Return with me and Chris Ryan. Here we go. All right, let's go. Miami Vice, now on DVD. Men from Miami. You guys are just the top, man. Hi, I'm Honey. It's a great feeling. From the Oscar-nominated director of Collateral, Michael Mann. He's got my vote. You can own all your favorite seasons of Miami Vice. We're in action. Too much excitement. The award-winning show, the New York Times calls a revolutionary series. Yeah, I know. Miami Vice's influence is still evident, starring Don Johnson, Philip Michael Thomas, and Edward James Olmos. What else? Featuring all of the unforgettable original hit music, remixed in Dolby 5.1. You're kidding. The women, the cars, the action. When it comes to Vice, you can't resist Miami Vice. Available now on DVD. I love it. What are you trying to say, pal? Let's check it out. All right, Chris Ryan is here. Every once in a while, you know, we do we do one one for them, one for them, one for them. Every one once in a while, it's a one for us. This is the all time one for us. It's ridiculous that we're doing this. This is a television show that uh, came out thirty seven years ago. It's the first time we've ever done a television show as a rewatchables. It might be the only time, and yet I feel like the two part Calderon's return which is the fourth and fifth episodes of season one of Miami Vice, one of the great TV shows of all time. Basically is one of the best mid-80s movies. I, I To me, it's like no different than Manhunter or some of the other ones that came out. I've watched it as many times as those movies, if not more. I've seen this so many times that I know most of the lines, which is weird. And it still holds up. Chris, Miami Vice, is this the first prestige drama? I mean, some people would probably argue that some of those other shows like St. Elsewhere and Hill Street Blues were there, but I would argue that Miami Vice is the first truly 80s drama, and it's the first TV show 
that incredible, like co- totally incorporated cinematic techniques into television. I watched when Ed Asner died recently and he did that incredible Mary Tyler Moore, won a couple Emmys, got nominated for a couple more. And then they spun it into Lou Grant, which was a mm-hmm. newspaper drama. And I was like, Lou Grant, I don't really remember that one. I went on YouTube and I watched like the first three minutes and it just felt like it was a 70s show, right? And that's like yeah. Hill Street Blues felt that way. San Elsewhere felt that way. There was a certain way TV happened. And Miami Vice is the turning point. Miami Vice comes out. It is still looks like it could go now. I mean, there's oh some God. 80s cheesiness, but for the most part- Some of the part, stunts, but for the, but like the cinematography and the locations and the look and the editing is, you would you could put it out today. Yeah, it's it's some of the best like music videos any anybody shot in that decade. And it just looks modern, which is crazy because it's 37 years old. And I feel like I've been watching this forever. What's funny, I made a- uh, I made Craig, producer, who had never seen my advice, I made him watch the pilot. Then there's two more episodes, and then there's Calderon's Return, which is two parts. So basically, if you watch the pilot and Calderon's Return, it's three hours total. It's the blueprint of how a Netflix series would go now. I think a Netflix series would string it out longer. But Calderon versus these two guys yeah. is season one of a Netflix series now. Yes. I would, but let's just for a second take a step back. It's the mid 80s. It's NBC, it's Friday nights, and they launch a show with a one and a half hour, I mean, two hour first episode. It was basically a movie. Yeah, then they do two episodic episodes, one which features Ed O'Neill as a federal uh, FBI agent who's in too deep with a porn ring in Miami. (laughs) Then they do Calderon's Return, which is another two-hour movie. So essentially, and then during Calderon's return is when they announced that Miami Vice would have a full season. Like, nobody really knew what was going on. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So it's just like, think about how, if this isn't like a Netflix thing where it all goes up at once. Like, this was on national, like a major network, and they did basically two movies to launch a show on TV. Which had never happened before. I don't even think they had had a two-hour show to launch a TV show before. And I remember watching the pilot because my mom was all excited about it for some reason. So we watched, it was a Friday night. I'm probably in like, I don't know, ninth grade, 10th grade, whatever. And it was like watching a movie. And it was like, wait, so we have to wait another week to get these guys back. And <laughs> yeah. um, you look at that season one, I, I would compare it. I always like to compare stuff to basketball in this podcast. I would compare this show to when Bill Russell comes into the NBA and brings this whole new dimension of like, athleticism, jumping, being around the rim, defense, just things. And people are like, what's this? That was Miami Vice. Miami Vice is go back on YouTube. Go watch a St. Elsewhere's episode. Go watch Hill Street Blues. Go watch The White Shadow. Go watch Lou Grant. Watch Cagney and Lacey. These shows feel like they happened a million years ago. And this show doesn't. And it introduces all these things and takes advantage of this really kind of awesome pop culture. 84 is one of the best pop culture years of all time, but the yeah. the music videoization that really starts two years before, but by 84 is in full bloom. And this is the first TV show that's like, how do we tap into that? How do we have entire four minute scenes where it's just guys driving and it's guys stopping at a phone booth <laughs> to call their ex-wife and ask if it was real. And then they hop back in the car and keep driving. And nobody had done that before. And that I think that's why we both revere this show would be my number one guess. So there's a couple of different versions of the creation of Miami Vice. I mean, there are different people who have different hands in it. But one of them is this version that Brandon Tartikoff, who is this you know revered network executive at NBC, just came up with an idea that was MTV Cops. Yep. And that that was the sort of germ of the idea. And Anthony Yurkovich, who had worked on Hill Street Blues, wrote a pilot, but then Man comes in. And Man kind of synthesizes everything and brings his own experiences and his own sensibility, obviously, to the, to the, to the show. And I, I do think it, it when you look back on it, it is like music video work in some ways. There is some stuff that reminds you of that. But I think it's kind of singular. And, and, and Man did too. I mean, even when you're talking about the use of music in this show, the scene you're talking about where uh, Crockett calls his ex-wife from a phone booth. In the, this is in, in the, the pilot, not in, in the pilot Rooms episode. Return. And this is the famous scene because Phil Collins in the air tonight is playing. So normally you would just be like, these guys are driving around and Phil Collins is playing. The editing is 
timed to the music. It's like cut to the music. And when Crockett calls his ex, Caroline, and he's like, was it ever real between us? The part of In the Air Tonight where Phil Collins goes, remember, (laughs) punches in while he's calling his ex-wife and asking if it was ever real. So like they were inter, they were mixing music into the, the narrative fabric of the show and also using it as this whole other like palette a color in their palette to make the whole experience. Yeah, I would say there's probably six different extended music scenes in Vice in season one yeah. that are the best music videos of the 80s, along with like, you know, five other choices. But that scene from the pilot, we see the Ferrari driving. That's the first long extended Ferrari. It's the first time Tubbs and Crockett just kind of glance at each other. And then there's a lot of unspoken stuff with those guys. The phone <laughs> booth, the big glowing diner sign in the background and Crockett yeah. getting out and he's just like, I'm going to call my wife and just make sure it was real before before, <laughs> before I see if I got shot. Did she, you do that to, to <laughs> your wife before you got on the phone with uh, Peyton Manning? No? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, driving to the airport, I might get shot, I might not. I just want to see if it's real. And then she does the, you bet it was. Yeah. And then the hang up and then the drums kick in and it's just like, there had been nothing like that on TV anymore uh, before. I wrote down a bunch of stuff that I think the show invented. And okay. look, we're not doing, this might be the only TV show we ever do on the rewatchables, but I really do feel like the parallel to the show is movies, not television. This is all stuff at events. I don't think any show before 1984 holds up. And I say that it hurts me to say that because I was there for most of them, but even a show like Cheers, which I think is really great. Mm-hmm. It's still really slow and it feels old. The clothes are old. You feel like you're in 1982 when you're watching it. You don't really feel like you're in, I mean, granted it's cartoony and some of the outfits and stuff, but there's a modern feel to this show that's rooted in the eighties, but also kind of makes sense in 2021 in a weird way. So, um, I think this is the first TV show that is actually still watchable for people like producer Craig. So you got that. I think it invented the multi-episode hook where you have characters come in and then come back later in the season, like Calderon did. Right. And I don't Lombard. think that had happened yeah. before, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I don't know. Did that happen on like Dynasty or Falcon Crest or, or anything like that? I mean, like there's that? soap opera stuff, but not like stuff that you could have just pulled out four episodes and it could have sure. been a three-hour movie. We mentioned the MTV influence and the music, but you also have Jan Hammer, <sighs> and you have, you know, probably the most important soundtrack theme song thing of the 80s. Do you remember for that first time you watched it, what what it was like when the theme song kicked in? Yeah, because I don't I don't remember that, but I remember the, the theme song was number one as a song. <laughs> like, think about that; it was the number one song during an era where there was like Michael Jackson and Huey yeah, Lewis and Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. Springsteen put out it was the album. number one song. Like, this show was literally a phenomenon. I think it invented the montage. Well, and, and this is a key thing. Both Sergei in the pilot. Eisenstein kind of invented the montage, but I get no. I get but for TV shows where it's yeah. like they're kind of telling you the backstory with this really cool. How many times do we see Tubbs like watching his brother get shot, holding you know oh, bending yeah. over all him the flashbacks with all like the, flashbacks. the music, and you're getting chills watching it. I think the show invented charismatic bad guys. <laughs> Call the Roan, like the Dennis Farina as Lombard. The Bruce Willis in the No Exit episode where he's Tony this white beating yeah. arms dealer. Like, we didn't, they were bad guys, but they were just bad guys. They weren't like parts that actors would want to play. And these were like star making parts. Like, Bruce Willis, this was the first break he ever had, episode yeah. seven. The show reinvigorated Miami. I mean, Scarface probably started it as like a location for Hollywood, but um, it, it even was reinvigorating it literally like they were redoing parts of the downtown for the show. And it was supposedly like South beach and some of these places that became places you would start visiting in the mid nineties. It kind of starts here with the show. The crew of stars and guest stars were great. I think the show invented the slow motion. No. <laughs> and the, and the cradling a dead body and looking up distressed, like two things done. Uh, clothes, outfit, the general look, the colors, stubble. Don Johnson's credited with inventing stubble. Like they started selling stubble razors after the <laughs> show. Lunch. Nobody had even thought about that before. Um, I think Johnson's one of the great TV leads of all time in this show. And I think Tubbs is one of the great second bananas ever. And then the last thing is just cops with pseudonyms. 
Oh, just cops with undercover names? Yeah, or just cops Cro- with Crockett's Burnett, Sonny Burnett forever. Nobody yeah. puts two and two together. I don't remember seeing that in the show. Anything else jumps to mind for you? Things the show invented? I mean, I think that what it, it invented more than anything was the idea of pushing the limits on what you could do with the medium. So like yeah. they, they they were always up against their schedule because like when you, I read this um amazing uh, Emily Benedict wrote uh, a 1985 Rolling Stone feature that's like on the set. It's awesome. And she's basically following them along on the production of a week and there's this scene where like the producer one of the producers of the show is basically in a Miami hotel. He's got two phones up to his ear and he's running a production meeting. And they're essentially overseeing the shooting of one episode, the editing of another, the scoring of another. They're like going, going, going. They're working 14-hour days. It sounds like, un, you know, not unlike most man productions, a really grinding, grueling. And they did 20 episodes. But essentially, every week, they're trying to push the limits of what people had ever seen, what standards and practices would allow them to put up. And I don't know. I mean, you would have to tell me, but this just really seems like the part point where television starts like pushing the envelope a little and maybe it it kind of dissipated a little after Miami Vice and some of the air goes out of Miami Vice especially after man leaves but you know even you were saying in after episode after season one maybe that doesn't come back until Oz I don't know I mean where where you're like I've never seen something like this on television I didn't know you could do this on television yeah the next time I remember the same feeling was NYPD Blue was which yeah. was 10 years later basically but that was the David Caruso character and the way they push the envelope and they're showing people's butts and there's a couple of swears and it just felt more modern than any show I'd seen. But you look back, I mean, this is the Emmys. Miami Vice was nominated for Outstanding Drama, didn't win. Cagney and Lacey wins. The other nominees were Hill Street Blues, Murder, She Wrote, and St. Elsewhere. That's just where we were. Drama series, you know, like people who got nominated, fame. Um, you saw... Hill Street Blues, Remington Steel, Trapper John MD. Like these are like <laughs> old shows. Yeah. And uh and Miami Vice just just felt like it came out of the moon. And then you had so it had another, a couple other things. Like if you have a show that becomes a hit, it needs to hit. There needs to be some trend stuff with it. You need to strike oil with a star that nobody's seen before, which happens here with Don Johnson. Don Johnson, I think when you talk about He's 35 now at that, at that yeah, point, Yeah, and he'd, right? he'd bounced around. You kind of knew who he was, but he had never found the right wall. When you talk about like instant out-of-nowhere TV phenomenons, especially in the 80s, he's he's got to be one of the first people mentioned. Like Ted Danson and Cheers was like this, even though you kind of knew him from Body Heat. Michael J. Fox and Family Ties, like immediately was a star. Bruce Willis and Moonlighting. Um, but the difference back then is like an incredible amount of people are watching TV. Like we, the cable really hadn't kicked in yet. We still only had a few cable channels. So Miami Vice could be on a Friday night and get, you know, 20 million people for an episode or 15 million right. people. And he just was massively famous. And pretty quickly you started to wonder how long is this guy going to be in a show? Right. Is this guy just going to be a movie star? What's going to happen with this? I think that also like, you know, it, he was the kind of, he was manufactured into something and then he like, wasn't he kind of like Caruso-esque in that he seemed uneasy with like both like the direction of the show, but also his celebrity. Like he was a kind of like bad boy, right? Yeah. And after the second year, he tried to leave to go make movies and NBC just, you know, backed up the Brinks truck to keep him. Right. It actually is probably better off if he leaves. And I think there's some good lessons about Miami Vice in general, a show that really flamed out way faster than it should. And part of it was probably because Michael Mann left, but they did way too many episodes, right? They did 112 episodes in five years. They should be doing like 13 a year because these were all basically movies. Um, they never added to the cast, which I always thought was a really fascinating lesson for shows that, you know, you look at a show like The Sopranos, The Sopranos was always adding. You yeah. know, they're adding Richie April, they're adding Joey Pants, you're out, there's characters, they would always add to the core. They would keep like the three or four, but add around it with new people that would come and go. And my advice never did that. They had the same two guys with the same like four sidekicks, basically for the entire run of the show, which was a huge they bring mistake. In it, Edward James almost joins in the episode after Call Their Own's Return too. And pretty much that's it, right? That's I it. mean, they have that's an it incredible- the rest of the way. A credible lineup of of guest stars. But that's the thing is like, we have to kind of like, I mean, if anybody younger who hasn't seen this show is checking it out, like, 
if you watch episodes after Calderon, you see essentially what TV was like, which was guest star who's a, who's the bad guy. They would basically have a case of the week and it would end in a shootout. Yeah. And there would be really cool episodes and really cool moments. And they did other two parters and there's Smuggler's Blues and there's Golden Triangle and stuff like that. There, there's really good episodes in the first season. But this was the most like movie like where it was, it wrapped up Tubbs's revenge plot. It had all this stuff to it. It got, you know, Sonny gets revenge for, for Lou. So it's like, it has like a, it's almost a self contained story. And that was so, it's so unique to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I can't even compare it to anything. Um, and there's great episodes after this. Like Evan is probably my favorite single episode. Lombard, no exit. They, there were some good ones. The Golden Triangle is a great two-parter. But the Calderon's return is iconic because the call back to the, the pilot. And then the real reason we're doing this is this is our guy, Michael Mann. Yeah. Who's our favorite rewatchables director. And at some point, we'll end up doing every single thing he's ever done. I think we've done a lot of them already. There's not a lot left. Um, we've done Miami Vice. We did Thief. We did Last of the Mohicans. We did Heat twice. Manhunter. We did Manhunter. <laughs> Um, we did collateral, yeah, and collateral, but this was the one where this show was so inventive. And even though he wasn't the creator, Anthony Yurkovich was, he was willfully responsible for the look, feel, and uh, and just how methodical this show was. And once once he goes away, the show's never the same. He creates the visual Bible for the show. I mean, to, to read the, the articles about Miami Vice at the time and just to kind of read about it now. It sounds like everything you see on the screen, everything you hear is essentially like at least signed off by on yep. by by man, if not like actually dictated by man. Yeah. And you texted me this was this Calderon's return is basically a dry run for Manhunter. The first part is like there's just like you can just see, and we talked about this. I think we talked about this mostly with Thief, but we like this is a guy who returns to themes, he re returns to images, he returns to situations, environments over and over and over again. And in some ways, you feel like man has just been chasing the perfect platonic version of certain ideas he has in his head throughout his 40 year career. You know, it's going to be 50 years. Like he, he has been chasing this for his whole career. But when you watch Calderon's part one and you see Sonny and Caroline at the safe house at the beach, and the kids playing in the sand and they're talking about their relationship, that's in Manhunter two years later. Right. Like that isn't the, the, the very, like the same images, like maybe not the dead tree or something like that or some of the framing, the extreme framing that they do, but the, the vibe, the color palette, it's all the same. So this gets nominated for 15 Emmys, only wins four, loses to Cagney and Lacey for drama. He not, must have been a really strong Cagney and Lacey year. I don't really remember it. Um, Don Johnson loses to William Daniels, who was the blowhard on St. Elsewhere, who was considered to be a really good actor at the time, but I, th I don't think his age well. Edward James almost wins for supporting actor. And then Yurkovich lost for, uh, for writing the pilot. Um, I, I, we should mention this before we get to the categories and all that stuff. I mean, the real reason other than man and the look and all the innovations and the, you know, just how this show was in the zeitgeist. And is like the perfect kind of 80s piece of pop culture property. The Crockett Tubbs thing, it's still one of my favorite partnerships. It yeah. really is. It's it, it's just great. They're they're different, they complement each other. Tubbs brings so much unintentional comedy. Crockett's so cool. Um, I Sonny Crockett's still probably my favorite detective TV or movies. He really is. I think he's number one. And Philip Michael Thomas who was basically, there's a great People Magazine piece. He's on the cover of People Magazine in 85. He, he was the one who created the EGOT. <laughs> I know. He had a necklace with I EGOT know. on it, and he's like, I'm going to win an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. And it, this guy was never heard from again after Miami Vice. There's just an amazing part of the Rolling Stone feature where like, whenever Philip Michael Thomas isn't, on set, he's trying to get studio time to work on his music. Right. And, that lo and it sometimes Johnson goes into the studio with him and works on it. And Johnson also had a, a he made a heartbeat singing. with Barbara Streisand. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. There's this really great, it really lasts up probably to um, maybe the mid 90s, anything pre internet where people just weren't self aware. 
But the height of it was the 70s and the 80s. And this is why I love the old Battle Network stars reruns and stuff. The guys are just, nobody's ever made fun of these celebrities. They're completely <laughs> unself-aware. Yeah. And they just do and say crazy things. And you have Philip Michael Thomas, who like genuinely felt like he was going to be the biggest star in the world. I think he thought he was going to be Michael Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I'm Michael Jackson crossed with, um, I don't even know who Denzel Washington is yet, but that, I'm him too. Right. Um, but the two of them, the chemistry they had together was the key to the show. And even like when the show started to fall apart and you get to like season five, Crockett gets amnesia, which is a really strong three-parter actually, when he gets amnesia <laughs> and becomes convinced he's a bad guy. And then he shoots tubs and it's just like, they, those guys had been through a lot. They've been yeah. through a lot, 112 episodes. But the whole concept of two detectives who have been together for a while, I love it. And I think- it's an essential theme for movies, right? It's like we love why we love Taggart and Rosewood or yeah, whoever. It's also, he's from New York. Uh, Tubbs is from New York. And th these early episodes still lean on that because he's still like the fish out of water in Miami. And Crockett's got a fucking alligator and is living on a houseboat and wearing tank tops. <laughs> but it's so yeah. cool. You get to find out like Crockett used to play football at University of Florida. Like there's like all these like really awesome like little wrinkles. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, so like this, when this show came out, yeah. It was Friday it was Friday nights, right? Cuz I only remember the first season or any of it really from sneaking onto the landing at my parents' house like up the top of the stairs from my room and watching it from above from down above the living room cuz my parents you know put me to bed at yeah. like, when I was 8 or 7 or whatever. But I remember it like being like my parents were like it's time for Miami Vice, you have to go to bed. And Oh wow, it's like an adult show. Yeah, and it, I reading about it, it also seems like this was like a slow burn. Like it was, you know, it wasn't it wasn't even like maybe even the top thirty Nielsen ratings in its first season. So it was like a little bit because it was hard. You know, it was on on nights that most people it was the were summer out. reruns were what what pushed oh, it over the top. Okay, that's what it was. That by that was when I think it was like critically beloved, and it did okay. But Friday nights were still really competitive. I mean, that was when Dallas was on and all these different shows. So I think it was a little bit of a counter-programming thing, and then it became a phenomenon. By the time right. they did the uh, season two premiere, which Pam Greer was on, right? It, it was on. Johnson was one of the biggest stars in the world. The other thing I wanted to ask you is you were talking about the trends, and it definitely still has like an incredible amount of influence over the way I think at least people like us think of, of Miami, people of our age. No question. But... Did did Miami Vice's trends make it into the Northeast? <laughs> like, did guys start wearing pastels? I have a couple photos from weddings in the mid '80s where the answer would that to be yes. I, I'll put one up on Instagram. <laughs> the white linen thing. I mean, they created a whole look. Nobody had ever seen it before. These Armani, these uh, linen Armani jackets that Crockett was wearing with no socks and with tank tops. Yeah, yeah. And tank tops and. Whole thing. What a show. Um, when we come back, we're going to do the categories for Calderon's Return, part one and two. Maybe the only TV episode we'll ever do on the rewatchables. This episode is supported by State Farm. Think about your first reaction after you have an accident. What do you do? You scream, oh no, or man, oh, why did this happen? On the flip side, let's say you buy a new car or you lease a new car get in there and it smells great. And you're like, man, this is awesome. But just remember, really the only words you need to remember are like a good neighbor. State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to somebody. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. All right. So quick recap of these plots. So part, <laughs> part one and part two are so different, which is why I love it as a two part. It's basically two complete. It's a movie that just does this crazy fork about halfway right. through. And now all of a sudden we're in like cocktail with Tom Cruise, basically. Right. We're um, down there with, with Jimbo in the Bahamas. <laughs> oh, Jimbo. We're going to get to him later. Uh, first one, Crockett's going through a divorce. Now he's not. Nope. No, he's back with his ex-wife. But what he doesn't realize is there's an Argentinian hitman out to kill him. So most rewatchable scenes. So first one for me is Crockett's divorce falling through all the way through the limo massacre with our guy, the Argentinian. So many, so such good Crockett in this. 
Well, our divorce was a bigger failure than our marriage. <laughs> just some great one-liners. He's just smoking constantly. There's cigarettes everywhere. He's he just smokes alert. lucky strikes all the time. It's amazing. And then, even though I'd seen the limo massacre a million times, I thought of you because that's really everything Chris Ryan wants from an action scene. That also, I wonder if they invent. Uh, well, no, I guess Godfather invents it, but like the the sick driver as the as the tip off that somebody's about to get hit. I love he gets the thing. He takes the break with the. Uh, he's yeah. got an elephant gun. <laughs> Takes a breath, <laughs> turns around, and just starts blowing uh, everybody away. And then that poor security guard comes up to him, and he does the Mozambique technique and does yeah, the yeah. two shots to the chest, one to the head, <laughs> takes that guy out. <laughs> the wing grows special. <laughs> the Argentinian, unbelievable. Uh, next rewatchable scene when they bust Linus Oliver, who has an incredible performance. He's yes. the big drug dealer in uh, part one. And he has the lines like, you infringed with my constitution. <laughs> uh, and then they find the suitcase. Finders keepers. Hey, I, I say we let the brother go. Hey, why not? Save the taxpayers, room service, and linen bills. Hit the bricks, Linus. Finders keepers. Hey, no, you keep it. We don't want it. Eight to five, Linus is history by midnight Wednesday. I'll take it. I say he makes it to Thursday. Yo, yo. And then we have them outside. <laughs> At this point, Crockett knows he's on a hit list. He's kind of glancing around nervously to see if who's in windows. That whole scene is just excellent. Yeah, with the guy coming up to him behind him with his cigarettes. Yeah. You uh, dropped this. Everything's great. Next one, this is also in part one, when uh, they realize after the I'm so excited tush montage, which we'll get to later, um, they realize they have the wrong guy. Mm -hmm. They thought they caught, they caught Mendez. They realize he's not the assassin. Tubbs pulls off some of the best overacting he's done really in season one. He's going after number eight. He's going after Sonny. Let me see, Gina. He's going after number eight. He's going after Sonny. Gina. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we kick into Russ Boward in the night. Oh my God. Oh my no close-ups of Tubbs, just Tubbs <laughs> driving a Daytona, a Ferrari Daytona, a hundred miles per hour through Miami. Tubbs really never got to drive the car, so I was happy for him. Yeah, you know, Crockett was usually driving it. Crockett's driving a station wagon with with his kid. There's a lot of in the pilot, and then in this two-parter, a lot of weaving through wet streets. They did. Yeah, Michael Mann, I think he invented the wet streets. <laughs> and just red light, people running red lights without a collision and just going 130 miles an hour. And then Crockett goes in to, he goes and gets his family, brings him back because they think the assassin's dead. And he notices the coffee and the donut spilled on the floor. Shootout, tub shows up. I'm here. He's in the dining room. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and they finally take down. Jumping over the wife and kid was a really great moment. Too. That that whole scene is lights out. That's all, and that also, I mean, we were talking about Manhunter. That shootout is is basically like the dry run for the Manhunter shootout at the end of the movie. With, it it is a such video. a Michael Mann scene. It feels very Michael Manny. Uh, and then the ending of this, they find out Lou's dead. Crockett's in the car. They finally broke Mendez down. Calderon's in the Bahamas. That's only 60 miles away. How long will it take you to get ready? I'm always ready. <laughs> Boom, drive off to be continued. Right. And you're watching that at home like, wait, what? Wait, <laughs> to be continued? We're, com we're, we're coming back next, what? Is great stuff. Uh, all right, a couple more from part two. This is just going to be my pick, I'm telling you now. Tubbs getting the confession out of Mendez with the glass. Yeah. The the lose replacement. I heard this call to room might have had something to do with your brother's death. Long pause. Philip Michael Thomas <laughs> milking it. Heard something from Milch over at Division last week. That this Calderon was responsible for your brother's death up in New York. You heard right. And then we kick into Voices with Russ Boward, one of the great underrated 80s songs. I'm, I can't wait to get to Voices, but what do you think the deal is with the guy who's in between Rodriguez and Castillo as the lieutenant? 
Do you think he was like, Boylan. do you think he's like, is this my part? Did I get it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's, he's like, so bad. The, the one night Jacques Vaughn gets to coach and he's just like, I got the job. He can't even get through. He's got like a 25 second monologue. He can't yeah, even get he through like, it. I feel like he that stumbles. was like a teamster or something. And they yeah. were like, why don't you come here and be the lieutenant? Somebody called in sick. That is like, to me, like if you're going to show somebody like, what was this show? I would just show them Tubbs versus Men. Tubbs versus Mendez with the glass, really yeah. shot in such a cool way for TV back then. Looks great now with the HD because they use real cameras. Then the you heard right with this evil synthesizer behind it. The right John Carpenter Russ Bowers. Yeah. And now we're just watching these guys on a speedboat for three minutes. And it's like, you know what we should add to the speedboat? How about a looking backwards montage of all the carnage that has just happened. And now yeah. we get to relive all the, it's just brilliant. It's so good. And so they, they basically, they're on the go fast boat on the cigarette boat across to, uh, you know, d down to the Bahamas. This song this is the most 80s song ever is playing. And they are doing these flashback montages of everything that happens in uh brother's keeper yeah. and Calderon part one. And then, so you have a three minute musical sequence. And then the credits happen. Yeah, and then <laughs> so we get the like, Miami Vice theme song. If we were watching it on TV at, at home, it would have been probably, what, eight, nine minutes without any dialogue? Because yeah, it would have been six and a half this, minutes. the music, the credits, and then, a, or, and then a commercial, right? It's six and a half minutes. And I, the reason I, I looked for that, because when we talk about groundbreaking stuff, like every TV show started the same way. It started with the credits. Right. And the credits were always at least a minute. They were always way too long. Go watch the Lou Grant credits are the craziest credits you'll ever watch. It starts with them cutting down a tree and ends up with them making the newspaper. And it goes on. It's like three. It goes on forever. My advice was like, fuck it. Let's just start with the show. We'll get to the credits a little bit later. And uh, it's it's really funny. Like, I'll watch it. When you watch old movies or old TV shows and the first six minutes are just like, some sad jazz while we get to see who the like the key grip is in the movie. Right. <laughs> and, like who is the associate assistant associate producer? They just and didn't get like, it. When is this fucking movie going to start? Why is Walter Matthau just walking down the street? The uh, slow motion highway hit when they're in the Bahamas with the masks. It's great. Oh my god, it's great. I I actually think this show invented the slow motion thing too. I don't well, remember seeing they're, that. They're but, ripping off Peck and Paul a little bit, but yeah. No, but I mean for TV. I, for I TV. just hadn't seen that sure. in a TV show where because there was a lot of it. There's a lot of Crockett grant glancing around in slow motion. Then on this highway, same thing. The car chase is good. They go into the water. Um, Calderon's final scene. Really good monologue. You know, the only time I see a judge is when I tee off with him at the country club. Forty-two million. $42 million tax-free. Why do you think they call it the land of opportunity? Huh? Even fat cats fry Calderon. Yeah, it's true. Only if they allow mistakes to exist. Yeah. About how he just can buy anyone he wants, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and he's so good in this. But then the, who you been talking to? And Tubbs comes out with the gun. Me. We had to shoot out. <laughs> and then I just love the ending. The the fact, I mean, we should have talked about it more at the top, but they would just get some of the best songs of the 80s. They would just pay for them. So you have, you know, Cindy Lauper and you have I'm So Excited by the Pointer Sisters and you have uh, ZZ Top. Like they would get the, the biggest bands we had. They end this with What's Love Got to Do With It, which was one of the biggest songs in 1984, the biggest song of Tina Turner's career. It was the perfect song to end this two-parter with. And, she, and Angelina does that what brought you to this island was far more than just your job. <laughs> and then Crockett comes in, Tubbs, let's go home. And then we just kick in with that song and we're, yes. we're on the speedboat again. And now we're montaging again. It's a double <laughs> montage. <laughs> but uh, I have for most rewatch, why I have the voices, the Tubbs leading into the voices montage is one of the great five minutes in TV history. Yeah, I mean, it's it's... It's just so iconic. I mean, like they obviously redo it again, kind of in Miami Vice the movie. But yeah, just they had the, to. Uh, the balls it must have taken to just be like, it's this song we're gonna, and this is the way you basically do previously on Miami Vice is yeah. instead of doing a 
last week on Miami Vice or two weeks ago on Miami Vice, you just do this montage and this flashback of everything that's brought these two guys together. It's so sick. Plus, you had an audience that was really conditioned to watching music videos in 1984 because we watched music videos. You would just watch MTV for three hours and see what the next video is going to be. Yeah. So it just, everything fits in. All right, let's go to what's age the best. I have an incredible amount for this. I tried to narrow it down. <laughs> First one is the concept of a hit list. Has it ever not worked ever in any form? TV, movies, anything? Second second of all, like just make sure any, everybody can get their hands on the hit list so it makes them even yeah. more paranoid. I mean, there's the hit list needs to be read. You know, art needs to be out there, shared. I love when there's the hit list and the guy just leaves it in the hotel room. It's not like in his back pocket. <laughs> just a piece of paper with eight names. It's got to be like in some fancy notebook and they got to look at it and be like, what's this? And then you cross over the dead guys. I just, I love it. I this was a borderline most rewatchable scene to me, but it's short, so I didn't put it in there. But the okay. when they come over to Crockett's house, it's a hit list, sonny, and you're on it. <laughs> and he's like, what do I care? I've been on hit list before. And he's like, yeah, eight he's, names in this. he's loving life with Caroline again. Yeah, he's back. He's like, I'm back with Max Wife. There's like, there are eight names on the list, Crockett. The first six are already dead. Uh-oh. Got to cut to commercial. Slow motion Crockett face. I love hit lists. Uh, that's another what's age the best for me. The slow motion Crockett, what the fuck face? Great. Yeah. Good job, Don Johnson. More what's age the best. The Argentinian assassin. The earplugs. I love when he puts the earplugs in before he starts committing murder. The shooting technique, unparalleled. We'll get to yeah. why, why it was so good. The yellow tinted glasses. His donut coffee call, calling no, card. Bill, you're, you don't undersell this. There is a shot in this show of a cup of coffee Vanilla cream donut with sprinkles. rainbow sprinkles. Yeah, yellow tinted sunglasses and a giant bullet just in the frame. It's like this is what this guy needs to get going in the morning. Sell the poster, man. I'm buying it. I'm framing <laughs> it for my living room. Yeah, that's it. All he really cares about is murder, donuts, and coffee. That's it. That's all he yeah. needs. I I've never seen those yellow tinted glasses before or since. So the uh, the music when he's in the safe house with his wife in Miami. Crockett, is that Crockett's theme? Crockett's theme has yeah. been my cell phone theme for like 10 years. Do, do, do. Yeah, you've People heard it. People probably heard it. Like maybe it's even made it into some pods when your phone rings. It probably has. Yeah, yeah, Crockett's theme. So that's an age the best. John, Don Johnson smoking. No complaints. We ju- who, who do we just rip on about their smoking? Tom Cruise and Rain Man. Yeah. If we had this best smoking bracket, which would be completely irresponsible. Nick Nolte in 48 Hours, <laughs> who's basically like the uncle of Sonny Crockett, basically. He's like his racist uncle. He was um, up for the role. Yeah. Nick Nolte in 48 Hours and Crockett in this, I think are in the finals. Is there anybody else who smoked better than those two guys? I guess I De Niro you- had some good moments and Goodfellas with Sigs. Mickey Rourke was pretty good smoking. Yeah, there's uh, Crockett. He does the thing with he tilts it. He doesn't do it with the in, with the two fingers next to your thumb. He does it with like thumb index finger turn, where it's just like it, and just everything seems effortless. He has. I had this in what's age the best. The after he gets together with his wife and they're in bed and they're like doing lovey dovey stuff, he's fucking smoking. He's getting he's in cigarette smoke. <laughs> and she gets up and he rolls over and takes another check. Like, I also think he's smoking filterless lucky strikes. So you, yeah, sometimes he'll like lick the cigarette a little bit, like it's a joint, but like it is that is in, intense to smoke filterless cigarettes is like <laughs> Another level of commitment. He's at least 10 or 11 cigarettes in this two-parter. Uh, Producer Craig has to watch The Great McCarthy, which I actually might be my favorite single episode, but that's Crockett. He's basically running shotgun for tubs that whole episode. Yeah. He's smoking. He's just cracking one-liners. It's like an unbelievable Crockett performance, but his smoking made me want to smoke someday. I watched it. And I'm like, you know what? Someday I'm going to have to do that. It just looks too cool. I'm going to have to try it. <laughs> Uh, part one, they go from I'm so excited right into Tush. Yeah. At the club. Tush kind of fell through the cracks as an, an amazing song. I will. It, the, the thing is, I don't really think of it as an 80s song. So it's like real, it's a good pull from the DJ at Linus's club. Great stuff. I'll also say that that club sh- sh- like fight scene and that whole situation very much like 
a setup for collateral, you know, and, oh, yeah. and when they do the, the Korea, Koreatown nightclub. Oh yeah. More would say the best Caroline Crockett. You talk Let's about, talk about it. Let's talk. Yeah. About it. Well, we've had, we did the Fletch podcast. We talked about Dana Willard, Nickerson, and our love for her. We did the Beverly Hills Cop podcast. I talked about my love for Lisa Ilbacher. Got mocked by you, Sean, and Wesley for two hours on it. I stand by it. Caroline Crockett, another one, played by Belinda Montgomery. Yeah. Just really did it for me. I don't know why why she never it's, really I mean, totally it would made it. It appeared to be that hairstyle. Yeah. It was, it's just, yeah, it's kind of rude in the 80s, but I, I really feel like she loves Sonny. Oh, you know, for it was the sure. job. It was the classic, yeah. like the job came yeah. between them, but I really feel like they had a connection. She's great and though. She was going to move to Atlanta, right? Yeah. What's she going to do in Atlanta? Come on. <laughs> the opening credits, we didn't really Maybe mention. not be on a kill list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. The opening credits, which were so f- ahead of their time. I love the highlight in the opening credits. You notice yeah. that? Highlight yes. just kind of is gone. There was a gambling also, scandal and highlight got ruined. They uh, they add and subtract stuff from the credits throughout the yeah. season. When you watch, like sometimes it's a very long shot of a woman in a bikini. Yeah. Sometimes it's the guy on the phone in the pool. It's awesome. Yeah. The um, it was directed by Thomas Carter, mm-hmm. the pilot, who's my guy from The White Shadow. He played Hayward. Yeah. This was like an all time crossover for me, where Hayward directing the important episode of. One of my favorite shows, but then in Calderon's Return, part two directed by Paul Michael Glazer. Starsky. From Starsky and Hutch. He was Starsky. Yeah. Unbelievable. Another one stage the best for me is Miami. Mm-hmm. I think this show, I think Scarface, um, there's been some pop culture stuff that really contributed to the legend of Miami in ways that I don't feel like any other city has benefited from, from TVs and movies. Do you agree with that? I guess San Francisco maybe would be the other one where you watch San, where San Francisco basically becomes a character in the movie. And it happens sometimes like Boston, like the town. Charlestown's sure. like a character of the town. But Miami just feels like this incredible, this world that you're going into. I mean, you're like, where is this? They're always talking about Miami on this show too. It's always yeah. like, welcome to Miami. You know, like it won't take you more than five minutes to score. Everybody's a hustler. Like, and they go to so many different cool locations. I mean, these episodes cost a million dollars to make per episode. And you have to like, you just for inflation, it makes it one of the most expensive shows that we'd be making today. And like everything is on location. And like man would pick like the house that Tony Amato in the Bruce Willis episode lives in. It's like the pink house, which is like this famous Miami Art Deco house, I think. And like man was just getting these locations because no one had ever shown Miami in that way. Smart. Yurkovich, the initial Miami Vice was was called Gold Coast and was supposed to be a movie. And then they flipped mm-hmm. on a TV show. But Yurkovich said when he was on Hill Street Blues, he started collecting information on Miami. He said, quote, I thought of it as sort of a modern day American Casablanca, an interesting socioeconomic tide pool, the incredible number of refugees from Central America and Cuba, the already extensive Cuban American community. And on top of that, the drug trade. Miami has become sort of a Barbary coast of free enterprise gone berserk. Yeah. Good way to put it. Good location for uh, a TV show. But Miami becomes a character in, a, in the greatest way. Masquerade parties, I think, is a what stage the best. Has the masquerade party ever not worked in a TV show or movie as a scene? Especially if it's like action thriller type of stuff. Has there ever been a masquerade party where somebody comes home from it and they're like, well, what happened today at night? And he was like, nah, not much. Yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's either Eyes Wide Shut or Calderon's <laughs> Return Part 2. Yeah, I was kidnapped by two bodyguards. Uh, another one's age the best was Grand Some Theft Auto. Some guy said Fidelio and things got real weird. <laughs> Grand, Theft Audio, uh, Grand Theft Auto Vice City is basically a Miami Vice episode. They did a great job of paying homage to that show. That's one of my favorite video games ever. The music, here's what they rip off just in these two parts. I'm so excited, Pointer Sisters, touched by uh, ZZ Top, In the Night, Russ Bauer, Crockett's theme, Jan Hammer. Jan Hammer? Jan Hammer? Yeah, ha- Jan, Jan Hammer. Ha- Hammer, yeah. Voices, Russ Bauer, Can't Turn Back by Red Rider, Angelina Flashback by Jan Hammer, and then What's Love Got to Do With It by Tina Turner. Yeah. That's like could have been released as an album. Yeah. Well, they That's would just, just one episode. 
they were the the people on the cutting edge where they were just like going to Glenn Fry and saying, "Hey, man, instead of just like using Smuggler's Blues at the end credits, we want to make it the entire episode." Yeah, and, and can you play be in it, it six times, and you should be in it. Yeah, and you're in it. Yeah. Last one stage the best for me, Michael Mann, our guy. Mm -hmm. Such a this is such a win for him. This show when we talk about the whole career and the uh, the filmography and everything. This is a really important piece. Like he did it on TV too. So any other would say the best for you? Yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, you you hit a lot of the ones I had listed, but I really love Crockett and Gina's relationship and how oh, yeah. it's kind of like, it's like tipped at. So if you watch like the first couple episodes, you know that Crockett's on the outs with his, with his, his ex Caroline, they're getting divorced. And one night he hooks up with Gina, who's another detective in Vice. But throughout and she the- know, And she knows she should stay away and she can't. Yeah. And throughout the season- it's kind of like they have these little like moments where you're like, oh, this seems like a little loaded. What's happening here? And it's because they have this history, but they never are like super explicit about it. So like when Sonny's family gets like uh, when they have to go to the safe house, like Gina's kind of like really nice to him about it. And he's like, I appreciate like it's a it's just a really cool element that they add in. But other, yeah, other than that, you you hit everything else. I would just say that in the first Calderones the synths that they use are basically Michael Myers horror synths. Like they're, they're just John Carpenter synths and Hammer does this incredible job just kind of making the Argentinians, it feels like a, a slasher movie, you know, yeah. like because this guy is like tracking Crockett throughout the city. I forgot to mention in what stage the best, the Crockett's boat, just the concept of living on a boat. I'm, a, yeah. I'm always into it. Always works for me. And well, do you ever foresee that you ever see that for yourself? A little boat life? I, I probably about five years from now, after uh, my I lose my entire family and everything, I'd probably just have a boat left. And I'm in you Marina and Elvis, De, Marina Del Rey. It's would you, you probably name no, the... it's me and Murph. Murph's yeah. just swimming in the ocean. It's just the two of us. I'm smoking again. Uh, uh, Spinoff category just for this unintentional comedy. What stage the best? <laughs> I mentioned Crockett making out with his wife as he's holding the cigarette. I thought that was great. Tubbs. In part one, he grabs the gun when they feel like the person might still be in the hotel and Tubbs is like, grabs the rifle and does this <laughs> run across the street. Yeah. And he's like doing these police technique things and it was just, it's hilarious. He and just then, grabs uh, it from the other cop. The cop's like, we yeah. should go. And he's like, no, nah, we got to wait. And then he just changes his mind and grabs the guy's shotgun. The cop's like, what the fuck? <laughs> and it ends with him. He's just in a, in the middle of like a street with a ton of people holding a yes. rifle. Nobody's yeah, scared. It would be pretty, and he never identifies himself as a police officer. It's just a dude running around with a shotgun. But the winner for the unintentional comedy word is every single scene where Tubbs overacts, overacts which uh, we'll get to later yes. when we do the, uh, the Vincent Hanna word. Tubbs has five moments in here where he dials it up in ways that, frankly, I, I don't know if we've covered on this podcast. I don't, I don't know if we're prepared for the power of it. All right, we're going to uh, take one more break and do What's Age the Worst. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. One resolution you can easily start on right now, save money. And all you have to do is switch to Mint Mobile for a limited time. Their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. And it's not just the price that makes Mint Mobile so great. They got some other stuff. No jaw-dropping monthly bills. No unexpected coverages. Every one of their plans comes with unlimited talk and text, and you still get high-speed data from the nation's largest 5G network, also at a great place. Plus, you can keep your phone you can keep your phone number. You can keep all your contacts. So why not ditch your overpriced plan? Get this new customer offer. Go to mintmobile.com slash rewatchables. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, what's age the worst? This is all plot stuff, but Sonny, they think they found the assassin. He just immediately goes to the safe house to get his wife and kids. They don't want to check it out. Make sure it's him. <laughs> he's, he's, we're good. Sonny's like, this is great. I'm going to get my wife. We got to yeah. get back to our small like bungalow. <laughs> is, I'm living in a sick safe house. Sonny, you want, you want to make sure we don't run a couple ideas and I'm not out. We're good. I'll get it back. The, uh, in part two, the easily telegraphed evil Bahamas police sheriff. Yes. Just a classic old school 70s. The guy's like 80s. really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. With the with the kind of smarmy smile on his face. Tubbs and Crockett, they drive into the water. 
Yeah. And the ma- and the Bahamas killers with the mask, they're just like, ah, oh, they must be dead. They they don't wait like 10 seconds. Well, the, the, also the car explodes in the water. <laughs> yeah, which was weird. How did that happen? Uh, that whole but scene's like, pretty bad. How those guys avoid like the reverberations of that. And then Angelina hooking up with Tubbs. Mm-hmm. I say they have spent three and a half minutes together. He sees her on the beach. They talk for two minutes. He shows up with her watch where she's teaching school. That's maybe two minutes. Uh-huh. And then shows up for their date early and they just start going at it. <laughs> they, they know, literally a total of four minutes of interactions. Is that Was it that easy to have sex in 1984? I don't know. I get the impression that Angelina doesn't have a really active dating life. You know, like I don't right. think a lot of guys in her father's business would go after her, you know, and g- give it a shot. So Good she's point. really hoping for a dude to walk up to her on the beach and start mentioning mentioning Cuban artists that he likes for his Soho gallery. Well, he's she's definitely on the go team. Casting what ifs. You mentioned Nick Nolte. Oh, wait, I had a couple of uh of what is the worst. Oh, go. Okay. So uh one is uh life before cell phones. So <laughs> There's a whole scene where Rodriguez is in uh, surgery for his thoracic wounds after getting shot with an elephant gun yeah. from across the bay. And Tubbs is in the hospital waiting room just reading a pamphlet about poison control. Because <laughs> in 1984, when you didn't have a fucking phone so that you could see what the dolphins were up to, you had to read whatever was in the waiting room. Right. And Tubbs is just reading why you shouldn't take poison. And it's just like this guy. Uh, another thing I would say, uh, just because you don't see it a lot anymore, but in the nightclub, in Ni- Linus's nightclub, uh, they ask for St. Pauli Girl. And you just don't see St. Pauli Girl around. Oh, that much. that's a great point. Yeah. And I was just like, this is a, the perfect 80s beer. It's like not quite Bex. You know what I mean? Like it's like St. Pauli Girl. Uh, Don jo- Johnson's Cuban accent has also uh, aged the worst, probably when he does like the, like the Desi Arnaz joke. And also, <laughs> right. I was just going to say, I, I appreciate the fact that Ludovico Armstrong, the Argentinian, is probably an elite hitman. But he really, really leaves a lot of evidence behind in that hotel room. Like, if Switech can find stuff, you're not really, like, covering your tracks. So when they're like, we found another receipt that has the guy's name on it. <laughs> like, it's like, really? <laughs> you found the, the Mendez's name on a receipt? It's a great point. He leaves his hit list behind, yes. names of the, his contacts, <laughs> donuts and coffee in every location. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. The, the fact that when he goes to stake out when he goes to to hide in, in Crockett's house when Crockett gets home and like the he just leaves a half eaten donut on the floor. I think anybody would notice that. Caroline would have noticed that. Yeah, he must have like actually he must have panicked when they showed up and kicked it over. But then why yeah. is he panicking? He's an elite hitman. I know. We forgot to mention one of the things I loved about this show is th- like they would use Zito and Switech. You know, they'd be like, we're on location at this bar or blah, blah, blah. And those guys would just immediately become bartenders and waiters yeah. or whatever yeah. the location needed. I they made $20 just... in tips. <laughs> they would always do that. If they're at a casino, all of a sudden they're blackjack dealers. Like they could, they were re- really malleable. I was always impressed by them. Casting what ifs. Nick Nolte and Jeff Bridges were the two movie stars they went after. But back then, movie stars didn't do TV. Mm-hmm. And 20 years later, that probably flipped. Mickey Rourke turned it down. He was already kind of a thing. And then it became Don Johnson versus Larry Wilcox of Chips. Hmm. And they decided that uh, Larry Wilcox already had the police pedigree with Chips and it would have been too weird. Larry Wilcox was really, really, really like a C minus. I'm amazed he made the final cut. It kind of shows how hard it was to find, you know, great people back then. But then Don Johnson gets it. And then after two years, when he when he had a big contract dispute, wanted to leave, they were going to replace him with Mark Harmon. Yeah, because he was leaving St. Elsewhere, right? Yeah, so it's just they're going to move Mark Harmon in there. That actually might have been the best thing for the show if Don Johnson had just banged out forty episodes. And then well, because it would have been cool too. Because if they had killed Crockett off, it would have you know that would have been like a sick multi part episode and some incredible overacting by Tubbs. Speaking of Tubbs, this is verified. I I I read it and I was like, this can't be true. And I looked it up. Denzel Washington auditioned for Tubbs. That's fucking Didn't ridiculous. get it. Philip Michael Thomas beat out Denzel Washington for Tubbs. Apparently, uh, Philip Michael Thomas and Don Johnson had some reading and just had this undeniable chemistry, which you can see in the show. They had great yeah, chemistry. Like they, they, they like didn't rehearse. They just like looked at each other and they were like, we're the guys, pretty yeah. much. 
Yeah. Pretty much. So uh, Philip Michael Thomas beat out Denzel Washington, one of the great <laughs> actors we have, <laughs> for a job. I just want, I just want that sick in. Producer Craig. Yeah. I know you're I know you're you're in disbelief that we're even doing this podcast. You didn't know anything about this show and you watched Philip Michael Thomas acting for the pilot and uh, all the stuff that he does that made him Philip Michael Thomas. Is it inconceivable to you that this person would have beaten out Denzel Washington for a job? Uh yes, it's 100% inconceivable i went on to look i was like gonna ask you guys i was like how, why have i never heard of this man like what happened to him <laughs> it's the it's the classic he had one thing and that was it but yeah i i don't even know what the sports equivalent would be it would be like i i did, like gardner Minshew beating out tom brady in 2001 <laughs> on the patriots remember when peyton hillis had that really good year at running back and was on the cover of madden and then never did anything ever again oh yeah that's, like, that's good but too. like who was peyton hill who did it, peyton hillis beat out for that job? peyton hillis you know beat out I mean? ladanian tomlinson and yeah. then was on the cover of madden and then we never saw him again uh best that guy okay the joey pants award so we have two really good choices here jim zubiena who plays ludovicio armstrong the arch titted hitman he was a shooting expert. He was Michael Mann's kind of shooting technician on the on the films of Michael Mann's like, fuck it, let's throw him in. He was in, he helped out on Thief. That's where Michael Mann met him. Helped out on Heat uh, and helped out on Collateral and was the master of the Mozambique drill, which I mentioned earlier. You shoot a victim twice in the chest, then in the head to guarantee a kill. I don't know, Chris. Where are you on the Mozambique drill? I would love to know what's the why. What's the root of the Mozambique? Like why Mozambique? I'm guessing some guy in Mozambique. <laughs> You're probably that came up right. With that. You're probably, probably right. It. So he's a candidate, and then Miguel Pinheiro, who plays Calderon, who's yeah, unbelievable. What an and this guy's got a fascinating life. It's so fascinating that Benjamin Bratt made an entire movie about him in 2001. Yeah. Where he played Pinheiro, he uh, was nominated for a Tony. He was a famous artist. It's F founded the New how Rican, he died. He founded the New York Poet Cafe in New York City. He's like a great. He's a playwright, actor. He comes back. He writes the script for Smuggler's Blues. Right, like one of the most fascinating Latino Hollywood kind of crossover people of the last. And I think 50 also, years. doesn't he come back to the show and play like a different guy on in like season two? Is Calder like does Pinheiro come back? No, his son comes back. Oh, his son. Okay. His son comes no, back. No, not Calderon. I mean, like, did the actor play? Oh, the actor, play, like, I don't a different know. Play? Yeah. I would go with uh, with Jim Zubina as the best that guy, just because I've never seen him again. The other nominee, I guess, would be the uh, bartender. I don't yeah, even know what that guy's name is. That's Sam McMurray, who is in everything and is, like, kind of... I mean, like, I think he's been... I think he's like a voice on The Simpsons, but Sam McMurray's just in like everything. I wasn't sure whether you were going to put Jimbo up for Dion Waiters or if he was Joey Pants. Uh, let's let's get let's let's make him for both. I think he's okay. probably our answer then if he's been in a bunch of stuff because I didn't I didn't know his name was Sam McMurray. Also, just like awesome character, awesome like this character. guy who comes down for spring break, smokes three joints, and never leaves. Yeah. is a great character. Great stuff. Vincent Hanna, give me how you got a word. This oh my can God, only this, go to Ricardo Tubbs. This, I, which, which line do you think it goes for? Your father had a cop shot to death in New York City. It's gotta be that. And that cop was my brother. <laughs> Miami last month. My father would never do that. Your father had a cop shot to death in New York City. Leave me alone. And that cop was my brother. I also like when, uh, when Crockett's on the hit list. And Crockett wants to go back out, and Tubbs like, you don't listen to me, man. You can't go out there, you know. Sit on some damn beach while Rodriguez hangs by a thread. That bullet he took was meant for me, Tubbs. Yeah, man. Hey, look, look, man. You go out, hey, hey, man. You go out there. You're going to end up right in here next to Rodriguez. You're not listening to me, man. You can't go out there, you know. It's too hot for you, Sonny. <laughs> it's so good. We got Craig. You got to play at least two of those. It's so good. He's so over the top. This whole his, and, episode. and his is the entire interrogation of Mendez. Oh yeah, and, the, and when he's just screaming, "Where is he? Where is he? Where is so, the hitter?" We could almost, if this wasn't a TV show, we could almost name the award after him. Vincent Hanna could pass the torch to Ricardo. Dan Waiters Award. Three incredible nominees: the Argentinian, mm -hmm. 
Linus Oliver and the St. Andrews bartender. I'm not going to do Calderon because I feel like he's an essential one. I think the winner, as much as I love the Argentinian and as much as I love Linus Oliver, who just crushes it, the St. Andrews bartender kind of carries scenes. He's incredible. He's a novelist. He's yeah. a drug dealer. He's a fixer. He's like, he's bringing them bad breakfasts. That whole breakfast moment where Jimbo shows up with their breakfast and Sonny's just <laughs> doing push-ups on like the hard balcony <laughs> and last night's scotch is still on the table. Yeah. And then and then like Sonny's just doing push-ups in like pants and espadrilles. And they're just like shirtless dudes hanging out drinking scotch. Where did they scotch? sleep? Did they share a king size bed? Do you, do Were there you two really rooms? think that they slept? <laughs> no, but maybe not. Yeah, you're right. Sonny probably. I mean, you could have easily just snuck in somebody just leaving the hotel, right? Some two girls leaving as Jimbo shows up with the breakfast, something like that. Uh, I have a. I have one more Dion Waiters nominee. Okay. And it and it's it's not as like usually Dion Waiters. I think we think of it as like a very like flashy role. But I'm gonna go with uh. Alan, Caroline Crockett's defense <laughs> attorney or her lawyer, <laughs> because he calls an audible at the line. He calls Omaha and he's right. just like, we want full custody. <laughs> right. and Caroline's like, what? <laughs> and then, his, then he doesn't care that it fell apart. I'm getting paid anyway. Yeah, he's anyway. just like, oh, fuck it. I'll go to lunch. I like <laughs> right, that one. I'm going with the bartender. Okay. The bartender is also the, uh, I didn't have that award for this one, but I guess you could do it. Like he's in his own show. Oh, the, yeah. bar, the bartender easily could have been spun off at 10 o'clock on Friday nights. Recasting couch. I don't even know who I would have recast this with, but um, Angelina is just not very good. That's if there if there's a real hole in this two-parter, just want a little more from her. She that, has a really cool look, though. She's like a very distinctive vibe. She does. How many IMDB credits do you think she has? Uh, 15. Three. Okay. <laughs> her name's Fanny Napoli. I was thinking, I was trying to think who would be the perfect one for this. I don't know if Sonia Braga was too old for this part, but that could have been the one. That's cool. That could have been the one that happened. Uh, half Fast Internet Research. Originally, these episodes, part one, part two, were called The Hit List and Calderon's Demise. And then when it got syndicated, they switched it. This is the Calderon's only time- Demise the, is kind of, kind of a spoiler in the title. Yeah, seriously. I'm surprised they did that. This is the only time in any episode that Tubbs got to drive the Ferrari, which I thought was crazy. They really want to crack it to drive the Ferrari. Um, Don Johnson's Italian sport coat, t-shirt, white linen pants, slip-on sockless loafers became an actual look that dominated fashion shows for the next two years all over the world. <laughs> so we should mention that. They used um, stereo broadcast music for the sound, which nobody mm -hmm. had done for a TV series before. And they spent 10,000 or more per episode just to buy the rights to songs, but they really yeah. cared about the audio piece. Crockett's Ferrari was not really a Ferrari. It was supposed to be a 1972 Ferrari Daytona Spider, but it was really a replica that was built uh, as a Corvette. But um, his boat was the Chris Craft Stinger 390X. That's the St. Vitus dance, right? That's the name yeah. of the boat? Yeah. Um. So Michael Mann was a no earth tones guy. There's yeah. no red or brown on Miami Vice. They flipped it, I think, as in later seasons, but you never see reds or browns, no earth stuff. All Let like me, aqua type things. So Crockett's walking around in $800 suits. He's got a yeah. boat. He's got a Ferrari. The idea, just so people know, is that like, I guess like they are using the drugs and money or the money that they, you know, seize from drug dealers to create undercover legends for their cops, right? Like, yeah. so it's not just like he's independently wealthy because as Calderon makes a big point of, like, these guys make like 350 bucks a week, right? Yep. <laughs> right? So it's all like prop stuff for them, basically. Mm -hmm. Johnson, because they didn't have stubble razors yet, <laughs> he shaved with a sideburn trimmer to get the look of the stubble. And then eventually... I think they released the Don Johnson stubble razor, which you could probably get on eBay. The uh, Miami Vice theme was the first TV theme to hit number one since Henry Mancini's theme from Peter Gunn in 1959. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Jan Hammer won two Grammy Awards. So uh, Lou, we mentioned how Lou died. Mm -hmm. Lou got written out. He didn't like living in Miami, apparently. This was the official story um, and wanted to be written out. So they killed him off. Then- there's 
a school of thought that they wrote him off because the character didn't work because he played uh, that guy Chano and Barney Miller for eight years, which was mm-hmm. a comedy. And I think Michael Mann, I think, decided that it was too hard to take him seriously. Well, there's a second in uh, Calderon 1 where it seems like maybe Lou is on the take. Right. right. And they kind of just drop it. And it winds up being Scotty Wheeler. <laughs> You were right. Yeah, poor Scotty. Well, Scott Jr. You were my those partner, man. Yeah. Scott Jr.'s medical bills were way up there. The uh, part one, part two titles are different. The part two titles went to end up being the uh, end of the series. And then if you watch when Don Johnson's firing off with the Argentinian, they have a a squib mistake where the squib explodes and he kind of recoils. That's like what really happened because the squib fucked up and almost like blew up in his face. Mm-hmm. So they had that, but they included that shot. Apex Mountain, I got a lot. Don Johnson, his apex is probably near the end of season one, but we're we're approaching. He's climbing the mountain right now. He's almost there. Right. It's probably summer of 85. Um, do you want to hear my Don Johnson story? Yeah. Rock, and, Rock Room and Country Club, Stanford, Connecticut. I'm caddying there. Summer of 85. Don Johnson is there playing... Uh, golf with a member. We find out. 85? So you're you're at peak Don Johnson. Peak Don Johnson. Like the f- most famous fucking guy in, in the most world. Most famous Don, ever. Yeah. He's there. My mom, it's her favorite show. I grab a pen and a paper. I hop in a golf cart and I chase him down to whatever hole he's on. I wait till he finishes on the green and I walk up to him and I say, we we love Miami Vice. It's my mom's favorite show. Can you can you sign something quick for me? So you're tenth grade right now. It's something like that. Yeah. Don Johnson's like absolutely, and he's like, "How old's your mom?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did your mom pop out from behind the tree? <laughs> my mom. Say- my, that would have been it. We never would have seen her again. She just would have been off with Don Johnson. But yeah, super nice sign. But I met Don Johnson that like literally when he was on Apex Mountain. Can I, I, this is from, I had this for half S internet research, but it goes well with this because it's a Don Johnson quote from Emily Benedict's piece. I won't, I won't believe her, yeah. but this is just like, when you read this, you're just like, this guy really, the action was the juice for this guy. Don Johnson in 1985. We're a bunch of misfits, really. He's talking about the cast. Every one of these people has paid his dues. The only thing that really makes us feel good is to take these chances. We've been through drugs and alcohol and outlaws and thieves. The whole crew is reformed. I mean, we've been around the block. I'm not saying we're the only messiah on the street, but we're damn sure one of them. Later, someone told me of an actor, not one of the principals, who had a little trouble with drugs and stole money from a director's trailer. Some of the cast members got together with him and worked it out themselves. Oh, my God. So it was like a real (laughs) band of brothers situation on the Miami Vice set. Yeah. Yeah, the Don Johnson history is a little rough. Like, he started dating Melanie Griffith when she was 14. That was great as the mid-70s, but that has not aged well. We could have put that on what stage the worst, but... I think they both had a lot of substance issues, stuff like that. He looks great on the show. You wouldn't know. Um, and now I still follow him on Instagram. He still looks great. He's got a son who's a basketball player. Oh, does he? Don Johnson doing well. Uh, Maury picks bound hit list. Has there been a better use of a hit list than a movie or a TV show that you can remember? What's a, one of the Dirty Harry movies kind of has a hit list, right? I feel like what is Netflix doing? Sometimes I just wonder <laughs> with them, like just, <laughs> do an algorithm show called Hit List. Yeah. <laughs> where it's just like, it's a hit list. That's it. That's it, all you need. Ger- Ger- Gerard Butler is a cop whose name is on a hit list. Yeah, he's number nine. And it's the first two are dead. And now every episode, the new, next guy dies. And we're all leading to Gerard Butler in episode seven. Apex Mountain for smoking for you? Who's done I it still, better? I, I still think Goodfellas. I still okay. think good, Goodfellas is Fair. better smoking. Miami... I'm going to say like 2012 heats, probably the apex. Miami's rounded in a shape a little bit. But let me ask you this. Is this the most that the rest of the country liked Miami? Because I think that the heat in 12, mm. like most people were like, fuck those guys. That's fair. Yeah. P- so America's love for Miami. Yeah. Argentinian assassins, definitely. Anthony Yurkovich, yes. I'm so excited as a song. There's another apex for it. We'll get to it later. Gregory Sierra, no. Miguel Pinheiro, probably. But I think he's, yeah, sure. Iconic think- bad guy character. St. Andrew's Island, can't remember as a movie TV location <laughs> having a better run than it has here. 
Sleeveless teal tank tops, definitely. Yeah. Philip Michael Thomas, no question. Members only jackets, which go here are Sopranos. Probably Sopranos. I would go, I would go Sopranos, yeah. Yeah. Michael Mann, no. The Mozambique drill, collateral. <laughs> Collateral. Collateral. Cruz. Better with Cruz. Russ Ballard. I don't think anyone's ever Apex Mountain did more than Russ Ballard. I mean, you you might have to name the category Russ Ballard. It's Russ Ballard. When you reach the top of Apex Mountain, Russ Ballard is there and he's playing his two songs. Voices is playing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) He has two songs in the span of basically 10 minutes of time on the show because it's the end of part one and it's the start of part two. Friday night ends, Miami Vice ends. You're thinking, man, that Russ Ballard song was sick. I wonder yeah. what I'm going to do for the rest of the week. And then you come back next Friday and fucking Russ Ballard is there waiting for you, jamming on voices. Yeah. Do you think he's like, what the fuck? Why, why, why wasn't I a bigger star with those two well, hits? Well, he was a big songwriter. He wrote like back in the New York groove. And like he has like a bunch of big hits that he wrote. But yeah, I'm sure he's like, can I not even be John Waite? Like, yeah, I, I was just going to say John Waite. It's yeah. like, really? John How Waite? am I not Christopher Cross? You know, like, oh, yeah. Oh, man. Um, all right, we're going to take one more break and then. I'm oh, wait, pick- I had a, I had oh, a go. name. My Apex Mountain was just, um, you, you kind of hit, hit on this, but like theme music for a character. So Crockett's theme, I think, is probably the apex of music that is just specifically for a character. Yeah. And also, this is Apex Mountain for going shirtless in long pants. Great point. One more break, and then we're going to pick some nits. This episode is brought to you by TurboTax. TurboTax experts make all your moves count, filing with 100% accuracy and getting your max refund guaranteed. So whether you're, I don't know, what are you doing, movie fans? Are you auctioning off opening night Q&A tickets? Are you selling movie memorabilia that you found? Some old blockbuster video stand posters? Did you start a movie podcast of your own? Whatever you're doing, switch to TurboTax and make your moves count. See guarantee details at TurboTax.com slash guarantees. Experts only available with TurboTax Live. This episode is brought to you by Royal Caribbean. It's so hard to choose what kind of vacation you want. Beach, island hopping, hiking, culture. What about choosing Royal Caribbean and going on all the vacations at once? You could test out your surfing skills. You can go on multiple onboard pools. I mean, think about it. If you go island hopping to a jaw-dropping range of Caribbean destinations, including the Bahamas, Bermuda, Jamaica, Mexico, many more, you can hike a Jamaican jungle. You can climb an Alaskan glacier. You can sail to Europe. You can snorkel along colorful reefs, jump off a waterfall, go, go jet skiing. You can do it all. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Visit royalcaribbean.com to learn more. All right, picking nits. We've done a couple of these already. I, I don't know. I'll never understand why the Argentinian didn't shoot Crockett, Tubbs, and Linus when they were all outside and he was sitting on a bench just watching them. Just take them down and you're done. Maybe you, he was you, he didn't want to like impact those kids who were running around. Yeah, maybe. Part two, Crockett decides I'm gonna pretend to be the Argentinian to collect. Mm-hmm. Has anyone seen what he's looked like? No. All right, great. I'll pretend to be the Argentinian. So we'll take Mendez's word for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then shows up and he's got like a Southern accent. It's like, you're definitely not Argentinian. I, I don't know how how dumb Calderon's henchman is, but it's like, yeah. So I, I'm going to meet the Argentinian to drop off the money. And then it's like fucking Don Johnson. <laughs> so those guys show up, start drinking coconut cocktails as soon as they arrive in St. Andrews. Yeah. And their plan is to do a duel, a dueling undercover operation where Tubbs is going to pretend to be a Soho art gallerist <laughs> and Crockett is going to be an Argentine killer for yeah. hire. And they're going to, but they're living together in a hotel room for some reason. Oh, so and, anybody we're also, could just- <laughs> and we're also going to tell the Bahamas police chief and it'll never occur to us that this guy might be on the take with Calderon. <laughs> it's, it's really some of the worst planning ever. They, they get made within five minutes. Yes. And then decide to go to the masquerade party anyway. Like, what do you think's going to happen a, there? I think even after they get attacked, they're still trying to like push their, their... Crockett's still pretending to be the Argentine even after they get attacked. Just bizarre. Can't explain it. Um, I a Borderline picking nits. Did the Caroline really think things were going to be better this time around with her <laughs> undercover <laughs> husband? 
<laughs> like, granted, I, you know, we've all been in love. I get it. But, but Bill, it's not the job. Yeah. What it does to you. <laughs> I know. It's, she's just like, is this, maybe the act, maybe I overthought this. Maybe we're like, no, you, you got to get away from this guy. You have a small child. Could this be remade as a 10 episode Netflix show? I really want to talk about this. Okay. First answer, yes. Second answer, I'm against remakes just in general, but I do think you could completely remake the pilot and this two-parter. And Calderon. As season one of a Netflix show where it's Crockett and Tubbs and Calderon is wreaking havoc with them. And there's a hit list. I think you could steal a lot of this stuff and I think it would work as a Netflix show. I really do. And I just think that should have been season one. It should have been eight episodes. You drag it out. Um, the When they're undercover, it's two episodes instead of one, stuff like that. But I really think it could have worked. And I, I think one of the mistakes they made with the movie was not just, I think, doing... They could have easily just done Calderon if they had you know, done that whole thing. They tried to go this other direction with it. Right. I don't mean to criticize the movie. We both love no, it. I but, no, I know what you mean. I, I think that that movie is really like more of like a an excuse for Michael Mann to kind of go into the outer reaches with digital photography and like his yeah. his like can I shoot in the dark of night with no lights at all and yet use cameras that can sense human behavior like he's on a different trip in that but it is kind of funny to think back on like how the show was so envelope pushing by doing a movie to start and then doing a two parter that's essentially a movie like it would have been cool if Colin Farrell and Jamie Foxx had a little bit of their shit together on the set, like if the movie of Miami Vice set up a show. Or set they, up like just movies every five years. Yeah, well, that's what they, well, the thing is, is that like they could have done it like Sherlock where they just did like three episodes every two years. If I was like, there's a three hour run, a three episode run of Miami Vice coming next week, wouldn't you cancel all your plans? I think they, I think they've made a huge mistake not reinvigorating this franchise. I really think it could have been like Fast and Furious type of a thing. I think they could have done six, seven movies. I think they could have done a huge Netflix show. The whole concept of two undercover cops in Miami who have chemistry and the whole thing and one's white, one's black, like it's just going to work. Yeah. And that you could have taken all the stuff that didn't work with the TV show and blown it out into a much better TV show. I'm amazed. Where are you, Michael Mann? Where are you on this stuff? Come on, Michael Mann, if you're listening, just do it. Do it in your the spare thing time. Is, you know what Michael Mann needs to do is, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with what he's doing now. He's making a show for HBO. He's making a show called Tokyo Vice. And like, I, I can't wait to watch it. But I think that Michael Mann needs to basically anoint us as his successors. <laughs> or or at least his conciliaries. Can't yeah, we just have just breakfast like, with him once every just, three months? Just getting involved in some of the IP he's got and just yeah. maybe you know, like what like what are we what what Mohican stories are we leaving on the on the table here, you know? I just want to know who's not giving Miami Vice a whirl on Netflix season yeah, one Miami they Vice. Just spent called a half a billion dollars on the Lord of the Rings show. Like what, we can't get like fifty million for Miami Vice. Let's get producer Craig's in his mid twenties. Producer Craig. Miami Vice, Calderon's return, eight episodes drop on Netflix. What's your reaction? Yeah, I think I'm down. We need more <laughs> Miami stuff. Yeah, more yeah. Miami stuff. Why are we in Chicago with nine NBC shows and Miami is no? Like it this would be so cool too because you could if you did it the way they did it back then, and you could do it like maybe you would get like um, you get the new Drake song to be in this in this show that week. You know what I mean? Like you would use that and then you would get like Tua could be in the, like a guest star. I mean, like Ballers, use, like, <laughs> Ballers basically Ballers. did this. No, Ballers <laughs> basically true. tried to do this and it was like the disaster version of it. Like just set, this should be a location. CSI Miami was on for nine years with Caruso just taking his sunglasses off. But it was like Miami <laughs> was the biggest character of that. Netflix, come on. Probably unanswerable questions. Here's my first one. Do Argentinian assassins love sprinkled donuts this much or was it just this guy? I think it was just his bit. This was this is right when we're starting to get into every bad guy needs a, a like a kind of a sort of a signature move, whether it's a donut, whether it's, you know, culminating with Hannibal Lecter. But like, this is the first, one of the first guys who's just like, yeah, my thing is I, I can shoot guys from across a harbor, but I also love a donut. I wonder if they have spr they don't have sprinkled donuts in Argentina. Maybe he just never seen it before. It's just yeah. luxury. It's just to like him. this is like, amazing. God, you, they put sprinkles on the donuts here. This is amazing. <laughs> I have to have these. 
Next question. So the fee for the eight murders was 120K. <laughs> Did that seem high or low to you? It's 1984. Really low. Seems low, right? Yeah. It's 15K a murder. Yeah. He's got to get the equipment. He's got to go down there, hotel room. He's he risking seems like his he does a life. lot of observation beforehand, a lot of prep work, you know? I mean, maybe that's why this guy maybe wasn't as good as we thought. Maybe they yeah. there was a 200K assassin. Where, but they, make him, sound the like the, they make him room. sound like the jackal where they're like, no one's met him. It's only like through a cutout, you know? <laughs> no one's met him except everywhere he goes, he leaves evidence behind. <laughs> so I'm so excited. Here's the run it has pop culture wise. I laid this out once on Twitter. It's in vacation in the Christy Brinkley scene. It's in one of the three best NBA is fantastic commercials ever made. It's in Miami Vice. It's in the iconic Save the Bell episode, the I'm so excited when Jesse overdoses on caffeine pills. It's on Fresh Prince. Carlton dances to I'm so excited. Then it has a comeback. It's on, in this century. It was on Drake and Josh had a big moment. It was in a Family Guy parody. It was in Transformers. We had Game of Thrones had a thing where the Game of Thrones cast sang I'm So Excited. <laughs> Is this the most influential pop culture song of all time? Has anything crossed over more things than randomly? I, I'm so excited by the Pointer Sisters. I don't think I ever knew that before you just laid out that case and now I can't unhear it. It's in two really, really huge movies, Vacation and Transformers. What's it's in, in the beginning of Co Beverly Hills Cop is Neutron Dance? Right? Yeah. Okay. It's too bad they didn't work it in there. It's in the best episode of Vice ever. It's the NBA Fantastic commercials is widely credited to making the league seem more personable. I, just to cross over sports, movies, music, TV is crazy. Number one Sunny ever in a movie or TV show. You have Sonny Crockett or Sonny Corleone. <laughs> Sonny Corleone. Come on. Over Crockett. <laughs> yeah. You're going to walk up to him, you're going to shoot him in the head. Boom. Yeah. Come on. It's Sonny right. Corleone. Can, can you ever go wrong with a Sonny? Do we need another Sonny? Does it, is it like an every 13, 15 years it's, thing? What's the deal? It's it's because like, and obviously it's a nickname for James Sonny Crockett, right? Is that his middle name right. or his nickname? And then Sonny is Santino. So like, how do you arrive? Can you just start calling Ben Sonny and see if it sticks? Craig, name your first kid Sonny. <laughs> Sonny Horlbeck. Listen, I'm down. I'm Italian. I'm ready for that. Sonny you Horlbeck. Name him Santino. Sounds, Santino. Yeah. Sonny yeah. Horlbeck sounds like he's definitely a, a quarterback, like in Div One somewhere. No, it's like he he goes to IMG and then he kind of winds up at like UCF or something like that. Like That's he's solid, not quite. Craig, you take yeah. that. Yeah, sure. Especially like if he ends up with Liz. Liz is tall. That kid might be like six six. <laughs> put that. Put that kid. I'm buying stock in that IMG stock right now. What piece of memorabilia would you want from this movie? I mean, the obvious answer is the boat. It, it's the boat. It's the Ferrari. But for me personally, I want the 2,172 page manuscript by Jimbo, the bartender. <laughs> that's a combination of Mutiny and the Bounty, Mutiny on the Bounty with Road Warrior, <laughs> a contemporary island classic. I thought the two masquerade party masks that Crockett and Tubbs wore would be good to just put on a wall. Be like, what's yeah. that? Oh, Calderon's Return Part Two. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> these guys were. What's, where are you at with uh, with Elvis? Great, great gimmick. Didn't overuse it. Unlike uh, Marce the monkey, Marcel. Yeah, it's the like, monkey it, and friends where they were like integrating the monkey and the storylines. Yeah, that Elvis was kind of there, but never overpowered an episode. So I, I was down with it. Do we know if it's possible to, to domesticate an alligator in that way, though? I don't think so. Probably not. Right. Probably not. Not not the most unrealistic moment. So of po this possibly show. an answerable question is does Crockett die from an alligator attack at any <laughs> given point? Or somebody on his boat. Yeah, maybe. Um who won who won the two part episode? So uh, let me should I make the case for Tubbs? Should I make the case for the character of Tubbs? I don't know if I'd make the case for Philip Michael Thomas's performance per se, but he does avenge his brother's death from Brother's Keeper. Like it is ultimately, even though Calderon goes after Crockett's family, it's Tubbs who's driving the story. It's Tubbs who's like, we got to get him. And it's like Tubbs is the outlaw cop who's taken, taken the law into his own hands. I have Crockett winning part one and Tubbs clearly runs away with part two. It's a blowout. Right. 
It's it's just he brings everything to the table. The unintentional comedy, some drama, some good acting. Um really makes you believe he could win over a woman in four minutes, which he does. Yeah. And uh, you know, he's just it's just great stuff all the way around. Um you could make a case for Tina Turner because them ending on what's love to do with it, what's you love got to do a, with it. A case for Ballard. Yeah, ba- <laughs> Russ Ballard. <laughs> what a Wait, could he, we make that case? I feel like we, we might actually. He plays two anthems at the end and beginning of two of the biggest episodes of TV of the 80s. Yeah, I think that's the answer. I think it's Russ Ballard. Well, the real answer is Michael Mann. But yes, I think Russ Ballard yeah, might the real have, answer like, is bad. A lot of winners. Did anybody win more off of these two episodes of television? I also think you and I are winners because nobody else would have ever thought to do this, to spend an hour and a half talking about a 37-year-old two-part TV episode. But I'm glad we did because it's How- important. How long would the NBA strike need to be for us to do binge mode the first season of Miami Vice? <laughs> oh my, it's like at least three years. <laughs> <laughs> I said this to you. I texted this to you, and I, I, I wholeheartedly believe it. I think these this two parter as a movie stands up to anything in 1984. Name the movie 19 like Purple Rain. Karate Kid, yeah. Amadeus. You pick pick a movie and just say, what's more entertaining to watch in 2021? And I will still say this two-parter. Just what an interesting time. You know, it's like the box office was like Ghostbusters and Karate Kid and, you know, in terms of endearment and those movies. If you had Born in the USA and Purple Rain had come out, there was all this great punk rock. There's all this amazing new wave, like Unforgettable Fire and Echo and the Bunnymen mm. are coming out. And it, I don't know. I mean, this show... It's 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 cool that it's so timeless because it was also so cutting edge. You know, at the time in eighty four, for it to have amazing songwriters like Russ Ballard every week, you know, it's just an amazing accomplishment. I wrote a piece in two thousand four for Page Two, back when my fingers worked, about that nineteen eighty four was the greatest pop culture year ever because we also had the Olympics, mm-hmm. but you also you had just major major stars all over the place, like real stars and kind of less clutter, you know? See, so we just had less channels. There were less movies. There were less TV shows. There was a better infrastructure to push push stars. So like when somebody like Huey Lewis became a star, it just felt like he was like this massive, massive, massive star all of a sudden. Yeah. It would happen over and over again. You guys had all the wrestling stuff back then. This was like Hulkamania is born in 1984. All over the place, Bird and Magic and the NBA and... Um, you had the 84 NFL draft or the 83 NFL draft, that class coming in and kicking ass with the quarterbacks. But um, it was an amazing time. We didn't Great do year. best best quote. Did you have any? Oh, it's got to be, well, our divorce was a bigger failure than our marriage. That's what, That almost could have been my high school yearbook quote. I My high school yearbook quote uh, should have been money that gets paid for, money that gets paid for blood gets paid in person. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I told Craig when we hired him for the rewatchables. Um, all right. That's it for the rewatchables. We Wait, are guys. Uh, I have a question about the show that I need to answer from both. of you. Oh, let's go. Okay. Let's hear it. Yeah. So I think the only connection that people my age have to this show or Don Johnson. And honestly, I bet you most of us just miss this reference is in the Wolf of Wall Street in the beginning when the Ferrari's driving and the Ferrari's red. And then Leo was narrating and he goes, no, 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 it wasn't red. It was white. Like Don Johnson. And then it switches, the car switches to white. The, the Ferrari in this show is black. Does it switch to white? No. That's weird. Do you know what well, I'm talking about, Chris? Yeah, I don't remember the exact line. I remember the Don Johnson line in Wolf, but I didn't it's know that he was like a movie. white. Leo's driving in his Ferrari and the Ferrari's red. And then he goes, and he's narrating. And he goes, no, 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 no. My Ferrari was white. Like Don Maybe Johnson's he gets one later in, like, in later seasons because I think Wolf is set in, later in the 80s. But I, I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Craig, you mentioned the other thing is that there's a whole generation that just knows Don Johnson as Dakota Johnson's dad. <laughs> yeah. And I was trying to think of what that would be like for us. It'd be like if like, like oh, Jennifer yeah. Aniston had a kid and then our kids were like, oh, that's... Becky Aniston's mom. Becky Aniston's mom. We're like, no, what the hell? That's that's Rachel from Friends. Mom. So I just found an article that it's about the iconic cocaine white Ferrari Testarossa in Miami Vice wasn't the crew's first choice for the show. So they they wind up in integrating a white Testarossa later. Huh. I forgot to put that in picky nits. I don't feel like cocaine was enough in the show. I, I know they had some restrictions with TV back I think then. It's, it, I think it's it's implied, implied all over the place. <laughs> yeah, but like did 
Tubbs definitely took a couple whirls. And I think Crockett <laughs> probably had a couple nights too, where it's like, all right, I'll do some blow tonight. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, with that but, bartender guy? Yeah. yeah. In, in 84 Miami, I just feel like it's in play. Like you're going out. It's not him, just like him and Gina are going to see some high life. Yeah. yeah. He's like, come on. He just breaks it out. <laughs> going to the Greyhound life. races. Yeah. Uh, so next week on the rewatchables, not sure yet. We, we do have one in the bank, but we'll see if we tape another one next week. But um, we have a lot of good stuff coming, including lots of rumors of the redeparted <laughs> for the, for the uh, anniversary. We did the departed. Um, I think it was like the ninth one we ever did. I don't think we yeah. had a lot of the categories yet. August just, 2017. So we got the 25th anniversary. Is it 25th anniversary or 15th anniversary? 15th. And uh, and we need to redo that. But we have some good ones coming up, including JFK will be over at some point over the next uh, next few weeks, which I think, Craig, that we all have to make sure we have full batteries in the recorders for that one. <laughs> that could be a four hour. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this podcast was produced by Craig Horlbeck. You can hear Chris Ryan on the watch. Sonny Horlbeck on the deck. Sonny, <laughs> Sonny Horlbeck. Watch out for him. Class of 2039 IMG. And uh, we'll see you next week in the rewatch. Peace.